Asthma and allergic rhinitis are really common conditions. It's thought that 80% of asthmatic sufferers have rhinitis and probably if you look for it hard enough, there's probably 100% of patients have it subclinically. So there's evidence that uh, they're synergistic in making each other worse. And until recently, there wasn't a whole lot of evidence of this. It was anecdotally known to be true, but a recent study showed that asthmatic patients who treated their rhinitis were less likely to present to emergency department. And there was a meta-analysis in the last year that showed that spirometry findings in patients who have asthma but treating their rhinitis were better than those who didn't. I think you have to assume in patients with asthma that they actually have allergic rhinitis because it's really a representation of a condition which affects the whole airway. So I think the default position is that they probably have both and you have to convince yourself uh, they don't need treatment in the upper airway. I think remaining a degree of clinical suspicion when it comes to uh, diagnosing rhinitis or upper airway involvement in patients who have allergic asthma and rhinitis is what's important here. Most of the time when patients come in who have poorly controlled asthma, these are the symptoms, the lower airway, which drives the consultation. Uh, they're more significant when it comes to general health. It's what results in serious health decline. And the upper airway, which unfortunately is the poor cousin of the whole equation, often gets left behind because patient and doctor are focusing on more life-threatening issues with the lower airway. And I think just remaining clinically vigilant for it is, is what's required. Asking patients that do they also have nasal congestion, do they find their mouth breathe, uh, do they have a lot of discharge from their nose. For their upper airway in patients already have broader airway disease, so they have asthma, intranasal corticosteroid sprays are what most patients should use first line. Antihistamines really provide only a limited suppression of the immune response where corticosteroid nasal sprays are well tolerated and they actually provide suppression across the whole spectrum of inflammation. So in asthma, there is an association with inflammatory sinus disease and simple nasal corticosteroid sprays are not treatments for these. Chronic rhinitis is what's treated with nasal corticosteroid sprays. There are three things that most GPs need to know. First of all is that uh, there's no atrophy of the respiratory mucosa. So patients, GPs are often worried about uh, atrophy of the skin, which occurs because of the nature of skin. Uh, and it is reversible with topical corticosteroids. But in the lung and in the upper airway, respiratory mucosa doesn't undergo atrophy. And there was a recent meta-analysis that showed that not only is there not a deleterious effect from using corticosteroids in either the lung or the nose, but in the nose, using corticosteroids actually prevented squamous metaplasia and changes that come about from poorly controlled inflammation. I guess the other part of this um, is the risk of bleeding. Many GPs are worried about bleeding. Bleeding is actually more related to the handedness of the person. So right-handed people tend to make bleeding in their right side of their nose and left hand in the left side. And this is thought to be mainly a technique issue of spraying the one area over and over again. The other part that GPs often worry about and patients are concerned about is absorption. Commonly, patients who have glaucoma or risk of cataracts, they say, is my nasal corticosteroid spray going to make any difference? There's conflicting evidence here because People publish simple case reports suggesting that there might be a link, but there was a meta-analysis recently that showed that over 4,000 people in randomised control trials demonstrated that there was absolutely no influence in patients using corticosteroid sprays and those who didn't in terms of ocular pressure, glaucoma and cataract formation. So I think the most important thing here is to ensure they have good technique. They need to understand why they're using it. And then I think we need to be able to alleviate their concerns by providing good evidence-based responses to the sort of questions that patients bring up when they're using corticosteroids. They're the most important things that I think GPs can do when confronting patients about using a long-term treatment because corticosteroid sprays are not designed to be used periodically for most people who have chronic airway conditions.